everyone. Welcome to episode number 578 of this here electronic engineering podcast called Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry, brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by me, Amelia Dalton. My guest this week is Femtosense CEO, Sam Folk. Sam and I are chatting about the role that sparsity will play in the future of AI, the details of Femtosense's SPU hardware platform, and how Femtosense's AI technology is being used for AI speech enhancement for hearing aids. Also this week, I investigate a groundbreaking new open source software toolkit that will allow you to design your very own functional warp drive. Yes, really. (laughs) But before all of that, please welcome Sam to Fish Fry. Hi, Sam. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Amelia. Nice to be here. Excellent. Okay, so for my audience who may not know, what is Femtosense all about and what was the inspiration to create your company? Thank you for the question. Thank you for having me. You know, Femtosense is all about trying to make AI much more efficient so that it really makes sense to bring it out into the world and to the real products in our lives, especially the deployment side. Our background, you know, we were coming from an academic environment. We, myself and co-founders, we were at Stanford doing our PhDs, building very different kinds of AI hardware uh, there, neuromorphic hardware. And you know, we didn't see anything like it in the market. So put your money where your mouth is, uh, or at least your time. And if you think that it's going to be a better technology and you don't see it out there, then it really is uh, up to you to bring that technology and those capabilities out into the world. So that was the real impetus to start the company. And you know, two parts of the name, you know, Femto, it goes milli, micro, nano, pico, femto, and order of prefixes. So it's really small. And then sense is, yeah, sure, the five senses, making sense of things. So we're really all about, you know, using these very tiny but complex, you know, electrical devices, these chips to turn the world into something that's that's quite meaningful and, you know, deliver those capabilities and the products that we use day to day. So you say that the future of AI is sparse. So talk to me about that and the role that sparsity plays in your solutions. For sure. Sparsity is definitely one of our core approaches to help make AI efficient. Remember, that's the the overall goal here. You know, when you start out as baby, right, you know, one of the first things that happens is you grow a lot of connections in your brain. And then as you grow up, you go to school, you, you know, just starting to get life experiences, you prune away all those connections, right? So we kind of take that idea and we put it in hardware and the algorithms that people use for AI. What we allow people to do is essentially teach their neural networks that it's not just all about performance, it's definitely also about efficiency too. And when you have those incentives, then the neural network learns to basically put a lot of zeros in itself. And then our hardware takes advantage of that. We don't store the zeros, uh, we don't pull them out of memory or put them in memory, and then we also don't operate on them, right? And that ultimately leads to savings in terms of silicon, energy, time, you know, all sorts of things. So this allows you to basically take a large model that you may want to do. And there's no question that the larger the model, the more interesting things it can do. And then actually deploy it in a reasonably sized piece of silicon that can go into all sorts of consumer electronic products. So this is why we use sparsity. We think it's a great idea. It's certainly a sort of a chicken and egg problem in the commercial world we had seen before. Algorithm developers, the AI developers, weren't really using this technique a lot, at least at the sort of the granularity that we provide because there wasn't hardware there. And likewise, if you're only viewing this from a, this opportunity from a hardware perspective, yeah, if you don't see the big workloads that people are wanting to do, you might conclude that this is not something worth building. But because our team is uh, quite vertically integrated between just as emphasized the hardware as well as software as well as the algorithms, we have these degrees of freedom to basically seize these opportunities that if you change the hardware to allow you to do things that the algorithm side that other people can't, well, there's your differentiating factor. I'm also interested in your SPU hardware platform. Tell me more about that. Yeah, the SVU platform is a chip that we have is really one of the core parts of helping algorithm developers deploy uh, and exploit sparsity. And we have our own you know, custom instruction set, custom architecture, you know, even layout, right? And all these really go towards letting the algorithm developers use this tool of sparsity, right? Again, the hardware, you don't store the zeros, you can pull them out of memory, you don't operate on them. And this ultimately, at the end of the day, allows the algorithm developers and the people building the products on top of it to deploy bigger applications and you know more valuable features. So that's where the platform comes in. And then of course you have to include the software with it. So you guys also have an SDK as well, right? Yep, absolutely. 
you know, as I said, the hardware is really nothing without the software tools. AI developers, they're already working in high-level frameworks that are pretty established now. You're talking about like the PyTorches, the TensorFlows, the Jaxes, right? And as an accelerator company, we really want to keep it that way. Uh, we don't, you know, they have plenty to do already, <laughs> let alone learn somebody's random instruction set, somebody's architecture, somebody's memory hierarchy. So we have this SDK and the tools that really help people stay at that level, iterate and deploy, right? All from that high level of description. So our tool chain, our SDK will basically take like PyTorch model, take it all the way down to assembly. It's a simulator too. So algorithm developers can very quickly iterate on their models and get the perspective on how much uh, energy, how much time uh, and how much memory or space it's going to consume. So that they very quickly find the feasible space of models they can explore. And then of course, you know, train those up, get them to high performance, and then reduce the friction that it takes to uh, actually deploy it to silicon. So you'll just take your PyTorch model, send it through the compiler, outspits an assembly file or bit file, and then that just gets loaded into our accelerator space and then you're off and running. So we want to make it very easy for uh, the AI developers. So I saw that Femtosense's AI technology has been used for AI speech enhancement for hearing aids. So Sam, tell me about that. Yeah, you know, hearing what you want to hear when you're out with friends at a restaurant is more or less the number one killer application for these hearing aids. Every year, new products get released talking about how they're doing better and better at this. Yeah, it makes absolute sense when you go out to dine with family and friends. You know, you don't want to hear the forks and knives touching the plates. You don't want to hear you know, the background sort of babble. You may not even want to hear the background music. <laughs> you want to hear kind of the people that you came to the restaurant to socialize with. And so the problem is, of course, what you want to hear and what you don't want to hear is all mixed up. And it is the job of these devices to extract what you want. So this classical signal processing, you know, I think we're past 60 years with these uh, more classical techniques. And what AI brings is a new kind of signal processing. And, you know, if you were to judge by the headlines, it looks like it's pretty promising in the what it could do. However, of course, the proverbial rubber has to meet the road somewhere. And even though you can get a nice sounding demo in the cloud or you know, on a website or something, if you're going to put into these products, you do have to satisfy the power constraints, the size constraints, the real timeness constraints, right? And these are things that with our silicon, with our software our reference algorithms or our partner's algorithms, we can really start enabling. So this allows you to really bring large AI into these tiny form factors that are very sensitive to power and size. So, you know, this is something that we're happy to work with, you know, our hearing aid partners and customers with to really bring the next generation of this killer app to the customer base. And thus far, could be better served. Fantastic. I love it. Well, Sam, I think it is time for your off the cuff question. So, Sam, if you could have one meal right now, it doesn't matter if it's on the other side of the world, you need a passport to get there, what would you have? <laughs> That's pretty interesting. You know, if I were to recall what some of the best meals were, it, would, it might be whatever meal happens after one of those like marathons. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, I think some of the best experience I've had with food <laughs> has been like, okay, you run one of these races, right? And then you come back and, you know, they have all the booze with all the foods, right? They even have like green bananas and a green banana will just taste great <laughs> uh, at that point, right? I think it's really more about, you know, whatever state you come into the meal than necessarily the meal itself. But yeah, if you were to ask me like, you know, what is the best food experience you've had? That's probably one of the better ones. And that could be anywhere. Fantastic. Well, Sam, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Amelia. Great to be here. Okay. How many of you out there have been obsessed with warp drives since you saw your first episode of Star Trek? Yes, I would count myself within that group. Absolutely. Well, folks, science fiction is now getting a lot closer to science fact for us warp drive aficionados. Because just last week, a group of international engineers and scientists called Applied Physics announced the groundbreaking launch of Warp Factory, a toolkit designed for the theoretical testing and advancement of realistic warp drive technologies. They also published a research paper called Analyzing Warp Drive Space Times with Warp Factory in the Journal of Classical and Quantum Gravity at the same time. Now, Applied Physics has been working on warp drives for a while now. 
In 2021, they released a series of papers, including a research paper called Introducing Physical Warp Drives, that suggested that warp drives could be constructed in accordance with the laws of physics. And now, just a couple years later, Applied Physics has released the very first open source resource for any researcher or physicist looking to test out their ideas for physical warp drives. The CEO of Applied Physics explains their new warp drive open source toolkit like this. Physicists can now generate and refine an array of warp drive designs with just a few clicks, allowing us to advance science at warp speed. Warp Factory serves as a virtual wind tunnel, enabling us to test and evaluate different warp designs. Science fiction is now inching closer to science fact. So, at the heart of this new venture into the warp drive unknown is the Advanced Propulsion Laboratory, or APL, at Applied Physics, with a mission grounded in leveraging cutting-edge methods in general relativity to pioneer new propulsion methods by manipulating space-time itself. So, what exactly is the Warp Factory? Well, Applied Physics explains it like this. It is a software toolkit created for analyzing warp drive spacetimes developed at APL. It enables users to explore Einstein's field equations, assess energy conditions, and calculate metric scalars. Additionally, it features 2D and 3D visual tools for displaying space-time metrics and their related stress-energy tensors, facilitating the study and comprehension of these intricate space-times. So, how can you get started working on your very own warp drive? First, you can explore Warp Factory on the Applied Physics GitHub and Gitbook, or you can also collaborate with Applied Physics as well. They have a Warp Fund to support their research in warp field mechanics, which is offering $500,000 in its first phase of grants. Now, this first phase is dedicated to foundational research into warp bubbles, aiming to revolutionize propulsion technology in the warp age. Super cool, right? I mean, yeah. <laughs> so, if you want any further information about applied physics, the warp factory, or femtosense, I've included a bunch of links below the player on this week's fish frying page on eejournal.com and in the description for this week's YouTube episode as well. Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash eejournal. If you're into X, you can monitor our tweets at eejournaltfm. And don't forget, if you would like to follow my personal account, check out Amelia D. 1978. And hey, if LinkedIn is more your thing, I dig it. You can follow us or me on LinkedIn as well. And we are now on Blue Sky Social and Mastodon too. And we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash eejournal. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series, hosted by me, and of course you can subscribe to our EE Journal YouTube channel as well. Also, make sure to subscribe to this here podcast on Spotify, Podbean, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or just about any other podcasting platform to listen to some exciting upcoming episodes. 
Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or, heck, you just want to chat, shoot me a line at Amelia, that's A-M-E-L-I-A, at eejournal.com, or post a comment on our forums on EE Journal. For the week of April 19th, 2024, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried.